This episode is brought to you by Audible. Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we cover bands and artists known for only one song. Now, I tend not to cover a lot of old, old oldies on this show, despite the boomer years being an untapped goldmine of short-lived artists. I got my reasons. It's super hard to find footage of them, and none of my viewers know these songs. But, after the monstrously long and difficult last few videos, I'd like to do something a little less intense. And boy, do we got a wispy little trifle of a song today. Here is 1970. The biggest names in music have made the album their medium of choice, leaving the singles market to a scourge known as bubblegum pop. A new form of music despised by all serious music fans for the crime of not being real music. Leading to a fun six decade debate about the value of authenticity in music that I am in no way tired of having. Anyway, one of the new bands in this genre is the British bubblegum act Edison Lighthouse. And they kicked off the entire decade with their one hit. A lovely little nothing called Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes, which hit the top five in America and hit number one in their home country. Yeah, I'm gonna guess this won't be my top few video of all time. Even in 1970, when this song was riding high, Edison Lighthouse was probably not the name on every record buyer's lips. So normally, I would leave this to the no one cares pile. Except that I actually have an excuse to bring it up because, once again, TikTok has weaved its chaotic magic. A couple of months ago, Edison Lighthouse, of all bands, went viral. Well, that's all the excuse I need. And as it turns out, this story is a lot weirder than I expected and lets me shine a flashlight into some dark, obscure corners of the pop music industry. Yeah, we're about to see how the sausage gets made. Come watch the oddest career in pop music history through the strange, strange story of Edison Lighthouse, an ephemeral band that vanished before they ever really began. Uh, I set up this series to discuss full careers, and that structure presumes that every one-hit wonder I cover had careers. They had ambitions to do more, have other famous songs, be remembered for something other than the one hit. Edison Lighthouse were not that kind of artist. Arguably, Edison Lighthouse were not artists at all. So let us start with this man, Tony Burroughs. Tony was in several bands. He also tried a solo career under the name Tony Bond. I must be dreaming. Eventually he joined a band called the Ivy League. None of these guys are Tony. He only joined this band after two of these guys, John Carter and Ken Lewis, quit the band to go into production. The year was 1967, and the streets of the Western world were crowded with smelly hippies. It was the summer of love, and people were flocking to the epicenter of the counterculture, San Francisco. If you're going to San Francisco. This song was a worldwide smash. And so, Carter and Lewis wrote their own little cash-in on the trend with a song called Let's Go to San Francisco. As you can tell, this is kind of a Beach Boys ripoff, which the Beach Boys were not from that part of California, but if you're a bunch of Brits who've never even left the island, maybe you don't know that. This song was performed by the Flower Pot Men, which, <laughs> you know, what a name, right? You know, flower as in flower power, pot as in <laughs> Perfect name if you're trying to look like a bunch of hippies. But hippies did not actually perform this because the Flower Pot Men did not technically exist. It was just a bunch of session musicians, one of which may or may not be Tony Burroughs. I have conflicting reports on that. In any case, the song caught on. And since Carter and Lewis needed a set of actual bodies to go out there and promote it, Tony got the gig. 
and little did he know, but jamming himself into this prefab little studio group of fake hippies had put him at the forefront of a new genre. Now, in the mid-60s, a lot of the great hits were being made by these charmingly amateurish garage bands, and with the rise of the Monkees, labels began realizing that the band did not actually have to play any of the music. And later, with the Archies, they realized they didn't even need the band. And with the peace and love hippies everywhere, it was pretty easy to take their psychedelic aesthetic and happy vibes and just take out all the drugs and sex. And so, a new group of extremely chipper bands started popping up. They had names like the 1910 Fruit Gum Company, Captain Groovy and his Bubblegum Army, the Rock and Roll Double Bubble Trading Card Company of Philadelphia 19141. These are all real. Almost all of the bubblegum acts were one-hit wonders, and the critics hated every single bit of it, but they did sell a lot of records. Anyway, let's go back to Tony Burroughs, who by 1969 had decided he was done also. The flower pot men had flamed out, and he was like, well, I got a family now, I don't really need to be living out on the road. And so he settled in for a long career of session work. Was that him giving up on his dreams, or did he think he still might hit it big? I don't know. But... Boy, did he ever. Okay, so you know how sometimes shit will pop up on your Spotify algorithm that you don't recognize and you try to find out about the artist but there's no information about them anywhere and the more you look, the more you start to suspect that it's a completely made up name slapped on some shit that Spotify produced themselves to get the right vibes for their playlists? Okay, well, Edison Lighthouse is the 1970 version of that. The number one record, and it's a great sound. And it's Edison's Lighthouse. In late 1969, Tony Burroughs stepped into one of his billions of studio gigs and recorded a song called Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes. Once he recorded it, he immediately pegged it as a potential hit and wanted to put his name on it. The label disagreed. Instead, they credited it to Edison Lighthouse, a band that, once again, did not exist. The name is a mangling of the famous Eddie Stone Lighthouse, and, uh, I guess Edison Lighthouse sounded psychedelic enough for 1970. It's fine. I think they didn't want to put Tony's name on it because Tony wasn't going to go out on the road. He had other commitments. Hence this video, which has not a single Tony Burroughs in it. Well, I guess one of those guys might also be named Tony Burroughs. I didn't check. Tony did agree to be in the band for their TV appearances, though, so there he is. Proof I didn't make him up. Now in America, Bubblegum was still connected to garage rock and tried to sound like it. Not so in the UK, where they didn't even have rock stations until 1967. So if you wanted to hear the Beatles, first you'd have to sit through the light, light hits of Perry Como. So when the Brits got into Bubblegum music, uh, they made the Archies sound like goddamn death metal. Like it was much closer to like the pre-rock and roll crooner music. And instead of cheapo guitar and organ, they tended to really lay on the strings and horns. It's very syrupy and sickly sweet. Now bubblegum is called that because it's not even candy. You can't swallow it, you get no nourishment out of it. And so you have this record, which is not a substantial song. He talks kinda lazy and people say she's crazy. It's about a girl, the girl's great. She is basically a manic pixie dream girl long before that term existed. She's a free spirit, man. I mean, by 1970, artists were not trying to jump on the hippie bandwagon anymore. That was well over. That's why the Flower Pot Men called it quits. But I do still sense a little flower power in this. It's a very garden-y song. She's got a plant name. Love grows wherever she goes, like sunflowers. I can only imagine this girl carrying a watering can. I gotta admit, I don't find this song super interesting, although I am fascinated by the way Tony pronounces the word mystery. And her life's a mystery. Mystery. But I think there is one really interesting thing about Love Grows, which is that it really doesn't have a chorus exactly. It kinda has like a one stanza structure. It feels like it should be the verse or the chorus, but instead they just kinda split in half, so you get like half a verse and half a chorus. Endlessly. And then they just keep repeating it. And they hit that hook really, really hard. Over and over. Because love grows where my rosemary goes. I mean, it's kind of a roller coaster of a song that just keeps slamming up and down. And before you've had a chance to recover, you're already at the next climax. 
I can totally see why this caught on on TikTok. In a way, this is like the perfect TikTok song, because there's like 20 seconds of song in it, and it's really catchy, and they just hammer it into you. You can't say it's like amazing lyrically. The performances aren't stunning. Sorry, Tony. So I think the reason it's lasted is just for being well constructed. This song is a solid pedigree. It was written by the same guy who wrote Build Me Up Buttercup. But it honestly more reminds me of later Bubblegum when the Swedes got a hold of it and they turned pop songwriting into this precise mathematical formula. I mean, the melody of this is just immaculate. It goes up and down with the mood and the lyrics and the music. It's just a solidly made song. Now, I've said some things in here about how disposable Bubblegum is. But of course it can't be that disposable. Here I am talking about it, how it went viral 50 years later. The fact is, it's never gone away. Even more than most Bubblegum songs, it's just ridiculously happy. Which has made it a pretty fitting choice for rom-coms, where it's shown up in the background repeatedly over the years. And in fact, Bubblegum pop as a whole was extremely influential. Shortly after this, the kids who were listening to Bubblegum music started glitter rock and glam rock. In fact, you can hear a little bit of T-Rex in that guitar. I'm a lucky fella and I just gotta tell her. I mean, you hear it, right? So yes, there's a lot to be said for this genre. It has more than its share of classics. Sugar Sugar, Everlasting Love. And a lot of your classic pop nerds will tell you that Love Grows is on that same high level. Mm, I don't know about that. The song's better than okay, certainly, but I, I just feel like there's not a lot to it. It feels somehow shorter than it is, and it's only like a two and a half minute song. I mean, it's good, it's just not great. In any case, for poor Edison Lighthouse, they found out quickly that careers do not grow where their hit single goes. Or more accurately, they did not find that out because they weren't real. So surely there's no more to this story, right? Well. Tony Burroughs, who had other commitments, never recorded an Edison Lighthouse song again. So they just replaced him and moved on, since they weren't really a real band with any permanent members anyway. So after this, we have two separate paths, Tony versus the band. And the band was just a bunch of randos they threw together, and their story is much less interesting, so let's knock that out of the way. It's up to you, but you do the things you wanna do with your life. This is their Tony-less follow-up, It's Up To You Petula, keeping with their tradition of love songs to girls with archaic names. If this had been a hit, I expect they'd have done like, Hey Your Great Constance or My Girl Marlene. Well, do you want my love, Petula? Now it's up to you. I believe the song is best described as inessential. It certainly didn't do very well. According to Wikipedia, they also had one other song that charted in New Zealand. Yes, she works in a woman's way. She's got a face just like a child. But her heart's a woman. Though she's acting so meek and so mild. But she works in a woman's way. This is a pedophile song. She smiles, her smile. I mean, maybe there's a way to interpret it that isn't about pedophilia, but uh, you'd have to do a lot of work to get there, and it's much easier and funnier to call them pedophiles, so there you go. After that, the band goes defunct. I checked out the only album they have on Spotify, and I wasn't impressed, but I did notice one interesting thing. To the best of my knowledge, this album, for the band that doesn't exist, the album also does not exist. I mean, it's, it's hard to verify these things 50 years later, and I don't know, maybe the internet just never documented it, but from what I can tell, there was never an album with this name, the band didn't release an album that year, it doesn't even have real cover art, a couple of these songs I couldn't prove were actual Edison Lighthouse songs, this one is a mislabeled Tony Burroughs solo record, and I found another album by them too that I couldn't verify. Uh, I don't know who owns this music now, but they are really honoring this band's legacy by keeping up their fakeness even through the streaming era. But ignore them, and let's go back to Tony Burroughs, who, as it turns out, became a bit of a trendsetter. So you know how there's like this weird thing in every era where it seems like everyone sings the same way? Like in the 90s it was this, and then it was emo voice, and now it's like indie girl voice. Okay, well in 1970, every other band on the radio sounded like Tony Burroughs. But in that case, 
it's a little different because all those bands were Tony Burroughs. In 1970, Tony Burroughs hit the charts with four different songs by four different bands. Now I love it when an artist becomes a one-hit wonder more than once, and yet somehow this is one of those well-known pop facts that completely missed me. How did I not know about this? And these hits weren't like one after the other either. They were all charting simultaneously. That's bananas. Let's check them all out. Here's the first band, White Plains, which is another fake name slapped on a bunch of unreleased songs by the Flower Pot Men. Their song is called My Baby Loves Lovin'. Again, you see no Tony, that's the bass player lip syncing. Tony performed with them on TV, but did not tour. Her baby love, her baby loves love, and she's got what it takes, and she knows how to use it. This is probably the most brainless of the songs you'll hear today. Check out their follow ups Love Lovin' My Baby, Loves My Baby Lovin', and Baby Lovin' Loves My Love Lovin' Baby. All right, here's Tony's third hit of 1970, United We Stand by Brotherhood of Man. Now this one has had a lot more of a shelf life than My Baby Loves Lovin', and it's certainly a lot more substantial. If the world around you falls apart, my love, then I this call for peace on earth resonated with a lot of people during the war-stricken boomer years, and it had a small revival after 9-11. Personally, I think it kinda sucks, but if it hit some hearts in 1970, I'm not gonna argue against it. Now, unlike most of the acts mentioned so far, Brotherhood of Man was an actual real-ass band. I'm not sure this actually counts as a one-hit wonder, because after Tony left, they kept soldiering on, and. It took a little bit, but eventually they did have a handful of other hits after they won Eurovision and then reinvented themselves as a bunch of ABBA ripoffs, and I mean rip-offs. Good God, what's the Swedish word for plagiarism? But anyway, Tony was only in this band for a hot minute, but... Yeah, all three of these songs were on the charts, which meant that Tony would have two of his bands booked for the same show, and he'd have to rush around and change costumes sitcom style between performances. One of the singers in the Brotherhood of Man, you'll also see in Edison Lighthouse, because in the first time, for, for the, I know anyway, when the same singer's been in two different groups. A lot of this footage is lost, but according to the record books, he was double booked on Top of the Pops four times. And finally, Tony Burroughs' fourth hit of 1970. This one is from a band called The Pipkins, and it is called Gimme That Dang. What happens to this one? This is a novelty record, big in England, by The Pipkins. Oh yeah, I know this one shows up in the background of comedies and commercials when they need the most annoying song in the universe. The Pipkins are a ragtime pastiche and I'm not sure how, but my gut says this is racist in some way. Man, fuck this. And so that is how Tony Burroughs became the biggest hit maker of 1970 without ever having a hit. Uh, they meaning Tony, uh, well, Tony tried to put out some solo records. One of them scraped onto the bottom of the Hot 100 and then disappeared. After that, he went on mostly to do session work. He sings backup for Elton John on Tiny Dancer. He also sang on the most famous soft drink commercial of all time. And that's all I know of what he was doing up until 1974, when Tony Burroughs became a one-hit wonder for the fifth and final time. This is Beach Baby by the band The First Class, another top 10 hit for Burroughs. For corny 70s pop, this is pretty all right. I love it when Brits talk about America. 
No Americans have ever said the words Old L.A. Beach, baby, beach, baby, there are the sand from July to the end of September. This came out the same year that Happy Days debuted, and I think this is one of the first real nostalgia songs of the 70s. Like, hey, remember our innocent teenage years? Remember dancing at the high school hop? Remember sock hops? Remember the Beach Boys? Remember all the good times before the world went fucking crazy? Wasn't that all great? Yeah, I bet it was. Yeah, that song's pretty fun. And after that, Tony Burroughs fades again from public view. They really tried to turn the first class into a real band, but none of the following records caught on, and after the second album they broke up. Burroughs kept recording with other imaginary bands. Names like Domino, Original Cast, Heart to Heart, Magic. Most of these songs have evaporated into the ether. But at that point, Tony Burroughs had enough hits that he has developed a sort of cult fan base. And he tours with the nostalgia circuits. He calls himself the voice of 1970. You know what? That's not a bad title to have. I, I, I don't even know how to answer that. Who is even the they we're talking about? I'm a lucky fella. I just gotta tell her. Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes is a fine little happy song, and the next time you fall in love, maybe turn it on and it'll sound absolutely amazing. I think it's pleasant enough. Wouldn't go out of my way for it. But as an amateur historian, this song is an amazing story about an absolutely ridiculous career in the margins of pop music. That's its value to me. Good luck, Tony Burroughs, wherever you are, and keep popping that bubble gum. <laughs> Thank you for watching, and while I have a moment, can I talk to you about Audible? Now, I read a lot of books for the extensive research I do for all these episodes, and if, like me, you're too busy or too scatterbrained to look at written words, there's no better solution than Audible.com. They have thousands of titles and podcasts on every topic, like this autobiography of Phil Collins narrated by Phil himself, and best of all, new members get to try it for 30 days for free. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. And you'll discover exclusive Audible originals from top celebrities, renowned experts, and exciting new voices in audio. Audible also includes thousands of podcasts from popular favorites to exclusive new series. Members also get full access to a growing selection of included audiobooks, audio originals, and podcasts. You can download or stream their included titles all you want. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, while traveling, working out, walking, doing chores, you decide. To try it out for yourself, visit audible.com slash Todd in the Shadows or text Todd in the Shadows to 500-500. Click now. Thank you and good night.